we're thankful to Dr. Jeffrey for being willing to uh, speak to us in this last session. Uh, he's doing this for free, so make sure you tell him thank you at the end, but we are thankful. Um, so yeah, Dr. Cole, go ahead and um, take it away. All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here. And uh, Greg, thank you for this invitation. This is exciting to do. So I have a PowerPoint. I think these days I feel incapable of, as a professor of doing anything without a PowerPoint. So I'm going to share my screen with all of you and see if I remember how to do this. Yes. All right. There we go. All right. And we'll use this to kind of just follow along. All right. Well, what I want to talk with you all today about is something I love deeply, which is the uh, subject of monsters. I've been in love with monsters virtually my whole life. When I was about seven years old, I was visiting my grandmother and I couldn't sleep one evening. So I got up and went downstairs and she was up just doing stuff around the house. And uh, she popped me a bowl of popcorn and we sat down and we watched old monster movies and on the TV. And I vividly remember watching the 1941 Lon Chaney Wolfman and just being mesmerized because it was a kid my parents were very protective they wouldn't let me watch anything scary my grandmother apparently disagreed so we watched a bunch of old monster movies together and that initiated a lifelong love for me of monsters and so as an academic i find myself often returning to the subject of monsters and wondering what they mean and what function they serve in our culture. So what I want to share with you today is a project that I'm working on. I'm, I'm hopefully uh, this will eventually become a book. And the goal of this book is to offer a Christian analysis of monsters because most theories of monsters in literature or movies or pop cultures are approaching the subject from a non-Christian perspective. And it's not that they don't have valid insights or important things to tell us, but most monster scholarship is not based on a Christian understanding of sin or evil, and those issues are at the heart of monster narratives. And so I've titled this talk, There Are Such Things, Monsters, Modernism, and the Denial of Human Nature. And these are the issues that we're going to get into and kind of uh, just explore and what monsters tell us about the, these things. So the word monster, if you're an uh, English major or a, a word nerd like I am, you love the etymology of things. The word monster is really interesting because in the Latin, monstrum means divine omen. And so in the classical world, view, monsters are always connected to the divine. There's always a link between this, these abnormal, hideous, frightening creatures and the supernatural. And the we believe that the word monstrum actually comes from two different Latin words that blended together. One is monstrere, which means to show, and the other is monere, which means to warn. And so these words combined together suggest that monsters are here to show us something or to remind us of something or to warn us against something. You've probably seen old maps um, with you know, monsters inscribed on them. Ancient cartographers and medieval cartographers would often do this. They draw monsters at the edge of the world. And it was a reminder to human beings about the dangers of going too far. I think simply put, that's one thing monsters do is they remind us about the dangers of going too far. And another way though of thinking about monsters is monsters are creatures that in produce intense fear. And of course, in our culture, we often use the word phobia, which comes from the Greek phobos, to mean an irrational fear or prejudice. And so there's another word we kind of, you know, need to dive into a minute is like the kind of the, the association between monsters and fear. Though I want to get into a little bit of clarification here, because there are lots of genres, whether it's science fiction or fantasy, that have creatures or kind of monstrous beings in them. Um, and so if you've grown up loving fantasy, or science fiction, you're familiar with this, fairy tales, for example. And this is where I think it's helpful to kind of understand the, the, the unique nature of monsters, because monsters, I would argue, properly belong to the horror genre. You're going to see creatures in other genres like fairy tales and science fiction, but those creatures work differently than they do in horror, because in the horror genre, the function of monsters is to produce fear, to make you feel fear. Whereas in a fairy tale, you expect there to be fantasy fantastic creatures. They're part of the world. And so they're not seen as an aberration from the world. So if you were to put on, let's say, a children's movie like Beauty and the Beast and you encounter the beast, he might be scary, but it's primarily because he's 
angry and mean, not because he's actually, you're just horrified the fact that the beast exists. In fact, that's the whole reason you're watching the movie or reading the story is because you want to experience creatures like that. In horror, monsters are always seen as something abnormal or threatening. Um, I like Noel Carroll, the philosopher. He writes a lot about the philosophy of horror. And he says the, the monster is a cosmic misfit. It doesn't belong in our world and we want it out of our world. And that's the whole goal of horror is managing these threats that are not supposed to be there. So I think that's helpful to remember because there are some genres where monsters are just seen as part of the world and they're an exciting part of the world. In horror, horror always deals with something that's unnatural, something that's threatening, something that's not supposed to be there. And this is, this is what monsters are and it's part of what they do. And so monsters as creatures are designed to give us fear. They're designed to produce this intense phobia. And like I said, in our culture, we tend to use phobia to talk about things that are irrational or, you know, a bigotry, transphobia, you know, uh, uh, homophobia, Islamophobia. Our culture uses those terms all the time to talk about prejudices and things like that. But this is where I think it's helpful to understand the root word because I'm using this phobia in a very specific sense here. This goes back to the Greek word phobos which comes from uh, Greek mythology. And so in Greek mythology, Ares, the god of war, had two sons, Deimos and Phobos. And Deimos, or dread, would often go before his father and prepare people for battle, or more accurately, uh, try to hinder them from preparing for battle by spreading dread, this, this sensation that something really bad is about to happen. But in the heart of the battle, Ares would unleash Phobos, and Phobos would attack people with overwhelming fear, and it would cause them to flee and to give up fight. And so this, this word, though, has a very interesting connotation in, in Greek uh, culture because it can mean two different things. So on one hand, phobos can mean fear or terror, like we, we might think in the context of a horror story, but it also implies reverence or awe. You typically experience fear when you encounter something greater than yourself. But in ancient mythology, the things you encounter that are greater than you are often a source of wonder or awe because they're connected to the divine. And so it inspires this religious impulse. And so we actually see this language throughout the Bible. So in Greek mythology, we see this emphasis on fear and terror and also awe. We see it in the New Testament, for example. So when Jesus walks on the water, the disciples see him and they think he's a ghost and they experience fear the same way we would if we were to see a ghost, you know, in our in our normal day to day existence. But then when the disciples go to the tomb and they see that the tomb is empty and they realize Jesus has risen from the dead, they feel incredible joy, but they also feel phobos, which here means awe. And so this is one of the things that I think if we think of monsters as creatures that produce phobos or fear, we have to realize monsters have two functions. They, they produce something that, that's terrifying, a sensation of fear but they also produce a sensation of awe. And these are not necessarily bad things. Uh, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So their fear is a complicated and very theological issue here. And that's one of the things I wanna to try to, I'm trying to unpack as I, as I research and write about monsters is why we're terrified of them, but why we're also fascinated with them. Why we, none of us want to be afraid, but yet in some ways, fear has a healthy spiritual component to it. These are, these are big philosophical issues that people have wrestled with for centuries. And I'm, I'm wrestling with myself as I try to make sense of these, all right? So one of the things I've found in studying monsters is that most monster scholarship is dominated by critical theory, um, by feminism, by psychoanalysis, by Marxism, these other brands of literary theory that, re and they all really boil down to the same point, which is that if you look at a monster story from any period in time, it tells you about the historical prejudices of those people. And so if I read, let's say the Odyssey and I see the Cyclops or the other creatures in the Odyssey, it tells me about ancient Greek xenophobia and how Greeks were afraid of foreigners. If I read Dracula and we've got these vampire women in Dracula, it tells me that the Victorians were afraid of women. That's a common way of reading monster narratives in secular academia. But I think there's a problem there because a lot of these theories are beginning with a, 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 a non-biblical, non-Christian understanding of the world, and they tend to assume that all things are just a product of social environments. But as Christians, we believe there is a, such a thing as universal truth. We believe that you know um, there, there are things that transcend history and that human nature does not fundamentally change, even though people in distinct places in life 
um, can develop distinct historical values that might be unique to them. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is the, the role of monsters in a universal sense. Monsters definitely they tell us about what particular groups of people are afraid of, but they also tell us what human beings across time throughout history are afraid of. And I think that there are three basic categories of monsters, and these represent the three distinct fears. Because as Christians, we believe that we are, as a Christian, I believe that we are uh, fallen people living in a fallen world. And so we were created in the image of God, but that image of God is constantly under assault. And so one kind of monster we see is a just a basic monster that destroys the body. We know the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's sacred. And so we all have this innate fear of losing our bodies, of any kind of violence that threatens our bodies. And so think Grendel in Beowulf. Uh, he's horrific because he charges into the Mead Hall, kills uh, the Danes and slaughters them. He's evil simply because he's mindlessly violent and he just loves to destroy people. And so we all have this innate fear fear of, uh, of harm to our body, and mon monsters reflect that. But some monsters do far more than just destroy the body. I would say they destroy the mind. So think werewolves or zombies. So in horror movies, everybody's afraid of getting attacked by a werewolf or a zombie because they might kill you, but we're also afraid because they might change you. And so what these monsters do is if they bite you, you get infected and you become one of them. And a characteristic of a werewolf or a zombie is that they have no rational mind. They have no intelligence. They're just mindless eating machines that create more mayhem and chaos because it's in their nature. And so we all have this fear of devolving to a state where we lose contact with our rational, uh, you know, uh, part of ourselves, where we're afraid of acting acting like an animal. And you see this throughout the ancient world where people do barbaric things and then they get turned into a werewolf or some sort of creature by the gods as a punishment. And the message is very clear. In Ovid's Metamorphoses, he tells the first werewolf story and it's about a cannibal king who gets turned into a werewolf. And the message is very clear. If you act like an animal, you're going to become an animal. And then I think there's a third category of monster that we're, we're probably, I would say, argue we're most afraid of, and that's a creature like the vampire. Because again, like all of these creatures, it threatens the body, it threatens the mind, but vampires also corrupt the soul. They don't just, they don't coerce you. They don't, you know, force you to become a monster. They tempt you into becoming a monster. And that is the most insidious kind of monster because it changes you from the inside out. And I would argue that Satan in Paradise Lost is the prototype of this kind of monster where he corrupts Adam and Eve by reasoning with them to the wrong conclusion in order to turn them against God. And so these are the kind of the three distinct kind of challenges that monsters represent. And I think all of these connect back to the image of God and this sense that with the image of God, the things that make us human, that separate us from the rest of the animal world are always under assault. But this is where things also get very tricky because we're not, we're not just people who live in a fallen world, according to the Bible, we're fallen people living in a fallen world. And so sin is something that threatens us externally, but it's also something that threatens us internally. And so I think from a Christian perspective, one of the things monsters remind us is that in a sense, every fallen person is a little bit monstrous. If monsters are abnormal things that are not meant to be, all of us in a sense are abnormal because the world we live in is not the world as God created it to be. It's not the way things were designed to work. And so there is this abnormality in the world outside of us that threatens us, but there's also this abnormality inside of us. And so monsters always deal with both internal and external abnormalities, these kind of perversions of nature that we know are not meant to be in the world around us, but also in ourselves. And so one of the things I'm going to keep coming back to is how monsters work work in relationship to this fear of losing the image of God, of having it desecrated or destroyed inside of us. So in the ancient world, monsters have a very specific function. Almost always monsters are sent to remind humanity that there are epistemological boundaries and moral boundaries. Think those dragons at the edge of the map that tell sailors don't sail past this point. There are things we can't know. You see this in the book of Job, where Job is wondering why we suffer. Why do evil and horrible and afflicting things happen to human beings? 
and God appears to Job and he talks to him and he points to the Leviathan. And we don't really know what the Leviathan is, but it's some sort of sea creature that no one can catch, no one can kill. And it's terrifying, but God uses it to prove a point that human beings have limits, whereas God does not. He created the Leviathan. He created Job. He is not constrained by anything. In fact, he's actually in control of everything that happens. Job turns to God and says, now I know that you're the Lord and no plan of yours can be thwarted. And so the Leviathan is there as a reminder of that there's a uh, only so much in reality we can understand. It's also a reminder that there are moral boundaries. And if you cross those, horrible things happen. And so over and over again, we see these two functions of monsters, that they are divinely sent to reaffirm a divine order from human beings who are rebellious and sinful and are likely to challenge those orders. And so monsters on one hand are terrifying, but they're also a reminder of the divine. And they connect us back to the gods or to God in the Judeo-Christian sense, and they inspire this kind of reverence or awe. And so monsters have a very conflicted relationship with humanity. We need them, but we're also both terrified of them. C.S. Lewis talks about this in the, um, the Problem of Pain. He talks about the new humanists, uh, this idea that there's some sort of supernatural force out there and human beings are both fascinated with it and terrified uh, of it at the same time. And we see this in the book of Job and we see this throughout classical mythology wherever monsters show up. So this, I, I think of monsters in the ancient context as symbols. They're meant to communicate a message to humanity. But I'm not primarily interested in ancient monsters. This is, this is just groundwork and this is just meant to set the context uh, for what I really want to talk about, because what I really want to talk with you guys about is modern monsters. The modern horror genre is really interesting. It developed in the late 1700s with the rise of gothic fiction. Um, I often teach The Castle of Otranto. I don't know if you guys have ever read that. It's a wonderfully bad novel. It's like a glorified Scooby-Doo episode. It's got ghosts and castles and secret passageways and ancient curses. And it's really, really dumb, but it's really fun to read. And that kicks off the rise of gothic fiction. And so the horror genre, as we you know think of it today, comes out of the gothic fiction. And by the 1800s with novels like Frankenstein and Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the basic conventions of the genre have been established. And so what I'm mostly interested in today talking with you guys is how do we make sense of the gothic, excuse me, the horror genre and modern monsters. If ancient monsters were symbols and the ancients thought of them as reminders of the divine order, what role do modern monsters play, especially in a secular society that doesn't think in those highly religious terms the way pre-modern people used to? So I think you can't talk about modern monsters without talking about the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, uh, Charles Dickens talks about the French Revolution as the best of times, the worst of times. I think the, the, the same thing might be said for the Enlightenment. So in many ways, the Enlightenment builds the modern world that we live in today with all of its wonderful advantages. Um, but it also sets in motion a secularizing ideology that is responsible for so many of the evils that we deal with in society today. So there's various ways to define the Enlightenment, but I always define it to my students as this, this incredible time in European history where you have philosophical changes, cultural changes, political changes, technological changes, and they all funnel together to create a new way of looking at the world that's radically different than how people thought about life in the Renaissance or the medieval era or the classical era. And so the Enlightenment has a political goal and a philosophical goal in a sense. And it, those two goals are to liberate the individual from the authority of state-sponsored churches and monarchical government. And so out of that, we get democratic governments, but, and so there's obviously a lot of good that comes from this, um, but there's also a lot of bad because one of the things that the enlightenment does is it makes the new authority in a person's life reason and science. And so rather than being guided by your, you know, priest or by your king, you're guided by yourself and you become the center of the universe. You become the center of authority. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, said that uh, the Enlightenment is man's emergence from knowledge. Knowledge is an old word that means, uh, you know, basically immaturity. 
And he, he, he says the, the motto of the Enlightenment is dare to know. So in other words, dare to think for yourself, dare to challenge authority and make your own decisions. And so one of the things that the Enlightenment leads to is what I'm going to call the Enlightenment Project. And this is one of the big goals of the Enlightenment. And so what many people in the Enlightenment wanted is to take reason and science and bring them together and use them to totally explain reality. So rather than relying on religion or superstition or tradition, you were going to use reason and science to explain all of reality. There's another word for this. It's called a toe, a total theory of everything. The Enlightenment initiates the desire for a total theory of everything. Ancient people, medieval people, even Renaissance people were far more comfortable with mystery, with enchantment, with uncertainty. Uh, they, they saw those as integral parts of reality that were never going to go away. The Enlightenment sees the world as this, this dark thing that can eventually be lightened up and that we can make sense of everything. And so for the Enlightenment, we see this twin drive to, first of all, explain everything in nature, that everything in nature can be explained in scientific rationalist terms. But it's not just about you know academic curiosity. There's a practical goal here, which is to take complete control of nature. Uh, the German philosopher Hartmut Rosa talks about the, one of the most uh, modern inventions of all time is the light switch. Um, you walk into a room and it's dark and you go, huh, I've got to flip the light. You add light to darkness or the air, the AC. You got, a lot of us are you know, in, in very hot parts of the country right now. We come in, we don't like the temperature, we adjust the temperature. Those, those devices allow us to alter our reality. And with it comes this expectation that reality is something we should be able to alter. We should be able to take control of it. We should be able to seize it and use it for our own purposes. And so I have a quote here uh, uh, by the French philosopher Diderot, who also created the famous encyclopedia, which again is a very enlightenment project because you want to take all the words and explain what they mean. Um, and he speaks very glowingly about nature, but it quickly becomes clear that what the enlightenment wants when they talk about their love for nature is they see nature as this thing that they can now take control of. And when they take control of it, they can master it and use it for their own purposes. And this is, the, this is a, a, an essential goal of the Enlightenment. And I think this is very deeply connected to the rise of the horror genre. So at the heart of the Enlightenment is this desire to control nature. And what that inevitably leads to is a desire to control human nature. The Enlightenment is very interested in figuring out how to build an ideal society. And you can't build an ideal society unless you can control people. And so in the Enlightenment, we see this radical shift in how people think about human nature. And I think that's reflected well by understanding the differences between two Genevans, John Calvin and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, Calvin was a, you know, it, 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 many people uh, talk about Calvinism and Calvin's beliefs, but in many ways, Calvin re didn't really invent any new doctrines. He just took doctrines from the past and he rearticulated them and synthesized them. And so he took Augustine's theology, borrowed a few ideas from Martin Luther, and he took Reformed theology and he didn't really create Reformed theology, but he was really good at systematizing it and communicating it to other people. Rousseau, I think, is very similar. Rousseau takes a lot of ideas that were happening in the Enlightenment, and he brings them together and he systematizes them in a way that had a huge impact in people in the late 1700s. But even though they came from the same city, Rousseau and Calvin could not be farther apart in terms of their ideology and their worldview. So for John Calvin, people are born into the world as sinners. We're born in a fallen world, but we're also fallen people. And so for Calvin, sin is not just something you do. It's not something you're tempted to do. It's a part of who you are. It's the fundamental part. And so Christians, you know, some Christians are reformed, some are not. Christians disagree about the extent of sin and how it corrupts us. But Calvin articulates a basic premise that all Christians would agree with is that we're not born basically good. We're born sinful and there's something fundamentally wrong with us. And we cannot fix that in ourselves and through ourselves. That's why we're dependent on divine grace, on God's divine intervention in our lives, that we need salvation. Rousseau rejects this idea and offers a new model of human understanding. And so this is a radical departure in terms of how people thought about human nature, because even the ancient Greeks, the Romans, they, they didn't have the Judeo-Christian understanding of sin, but they recognized that there's something broken in human beings and all of society has to be designed 
to deal with that brokenness. And so Rousseau takes these ideas, he throws them away, and he offers a new model of humans to understand uh, human nature, which is radically different than Calvin and the Judeo-Christian tradition. So to understand Rousseau, I think there, there are two key concepts you have to understand. And again, he did not invent these, but he popularizes them, and they're at the heart of his philosophy. So one is the concept of the blank slate or the tabula rasa. And I have a picture of that here. It's, a, it's just a great illustration of this idea. And so uh, Rousseau gets this idea from a number of philosophers. The most likely one is probably John Locke. And so John Locke says that the human mind is kind of like a white piece of paper. It's born without any instincts, without any innate ideas. We come into the world without anything written on us. And so whoever we become, is a reflection of our social experiences. Locke says, where do we get our ideas from? We get them from experience. I, when I talk about this with my students, they always laugh at this analogy, but it just makes sense to me. I always compare it, contrast human beings gains to beavers. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you were to take a baby beaver that's been separated from its mother, that's never lived in the wild, and to put it in a pool or to put it in a pond, it would immediately start building a dam. Beavers know how to do that because they have this innate nature. They are born with a knowledge of how to design structures. And so they, they are compelled by their nature to do that. Locke theorizes that human beings aren't like beavers. We don't come into the world with any innate nature or instincts. We get our ideas from experience. And so we can constantly revise ourselves. We can wipe the slate clean as we learn. This is at the heart of Rousseau's idea. Rousseau believes that human beings are not born good or bad. We're just born neutral. And so if we become bad, it's not because of some original sin or some sort of total depravity in our nature. It's because of some sort of external influence on us. And this is a, a, an essential idea to understand Rousseau's philosophy. The next idea that's essential to Rose, uh, Rousseau's philosophy is the idea of the noble savage. And Rousseau believes uh, that people are actually, they're not corrupted by a lack of civilization we you know we think of like barbarians people who don't have the ancient greeks talked about barbarians as people who were too uncivilized they were too removed from social influences rousseau argues that it's the other way around that what corrupts people is civilization and so rousseau argues that if people are born in a natural state or what he calls the state of nature they're actually going to become good. They're not going to be corrupted. They're not going to be have any, you know, drive to steal from their neighbors or rape or pillage or commit murder. They're going to be good citizens. And the more and more civilized we get, the more and more interactions we have with other people, the more our nature is corrupted. And so for Rousseau, the only way we can produce good people is to go back to nature and to reclaim this lost identity. He says the history of civilization is a history of corrupting human beings. In another one of his writings, he says, man is born free, but everywhere he's in chains. So and eventually society enslaves us, it corrupts us, and it removes that nobility from our nature. And so one of the things you see in Rousseau's writings is this, this um, you know, idealization of Native Americans, indigenous people in the New World that Europeans are starting to interact with as they colonize the New World. Um, and there's this idealization of their cultures and this assumption that those people are actually morally better and you know, they're just happier than Europeans. And so from Rousseau, we get this, this idea that people are born a blank slate, they're born based inherently good, and then they're, they're corrupted by their social influences. And this idea gets established in Enlightenment culture, and it's passed down by you know, other generations, and it is at the heart of so many things we believe today as a modern society. So Steven Pinker has an excellent book. I recommend it to everyone. It's called The Blank Slate and the Modern Denial of Human Nature. My title of my presentation is riffing on that. And Pinker basically says that the, the blank slate is the, the, the religion of secularism. Because if you believe that people are basically good, are they in, at least in morally neutral, and they're programmed by society, that puts this tremendous impetus to create a perfect society. And if you can get the programming right, you can get the people right. If you can come up, if you can finally tune the machine just enough you can produce the kind of people you want to produce. And so this idea is essential to uh, so many people in the Enlightenment in terms of how they see human nature and what they want to do in the world, which is to program people to build a perfect utopian society. 
So the, all this sets us up to what I really want to talk about, which is monsters and how the modern horror novel responds to modernism, specifically this idea of the blank slate. So I have four points that I want to make, and I, I find it helpful to just let you know what those are so you're not trying to track with me and try to figure it out as we go along. So the first point is that the horror genre is a critique of the Enlightenment. I believe that horror is always anti-Enlightenment um, because the goal of the Enlightenment is to explain the world and then take control of the world. And monsters have a habit of reminding us that the world is not something we can control or even explain fully or adequately. The second point is that monsters show us that when we try to deny human nature. When we move from Calvin to Rousseau, when we try to argue that people are born basically good, that we're blank slates, and we reject the idea of original sin or some sort of corruption in human nature, that we eventually end up actually destroying human nature, that we end up destroying the image of God in people. The third point I want to make is that great horror novels are always a a challenge or a refutation of blank slate psychology. They always deconstruct this idea. And then finally, that great horror novels always remind us that for human beings, because I believe we're made in the image of God, we were meant to connect with someone who is greater than us spiritually, and we were meant to stand in reverence of that person. We need fear in some way. And so this is one of the big philosophical dilemmas in uh, horror studies is why do people like to watch horror? Why do they like to read scary books? Why do we like to be afraid? And I think it's because we have that, that desire for the numinous. We have this desire to connect with something that's greater than ourselves. So these are the four points I want to make as I take you through three classic monster novels and talk about how I think they're responding to these ideas. So the first is Frankenstein. And I have taught Frankenstein for many years. And it's a, it, it's a novel that I feel like at first is deceptively simple. But every time I read it, I realize that there are so many more dimensions of it. And there are so many complex issues in it than I thought. And so uh, it's only been relatively recently that my understanding of Frankenstein has started to shift radically. Because what I thought, that I, I would say, I've been teaching this for years, but I think I fell into the pop culture understanding of Frankenstein. So in pop culture, or at least in the popular imagination, most people, when they think of Frankenstein, they probably think of someone like Boris Karloff, his classic 1931 performance, where he's this kind of like mute monster who can only grunt and growl. And he's basically like a toddler. I have a small son who's just learned to walk. So this makes a lot of sense to me. He actually walks with his arms kind of like this. And grunts and growls. And we think of the monster as like a child. He doesn't, can't speak. He doesn't understand the world. He's still learning. And in the, in the Boris Karloff film, we see that the monster, when he's left to himself and he's treated well, he's kind, he's good. But then it's the villagers with their pickaxes and their torches, you know, they come along and they terrorize him and that makes him la lash out. And so according to the kind of the popular understanding of Frankenstein, the message is if you mistreat someone, they're going to treat you badly. If you treat them nicely, they'll treat you well. That's actually what Percy Shelley marries Shelley's husband uh, said in a review. It's like, that's the message of this novel. I think Mary Shelley would have actually disagreed. Um, because one of the things, I, like I said, I think horror always does is it challenges our desire to believe that people are basically good and that we are just the products of our environment. And so what Mary Shelley does in this novel, let's see, is this maybe, give me one second. There we go. Oops. Uh, is she takes these ideas and she complicates them and she shows that blank slate psychology has a lot of contradictions in it. So in the novel, we begin with Robert Walton and Robert Walton is almost always removed from every movie version of Frankenstein. He's the, he's the narrator of the story. And Robert Walton is an explorer who's trying to get to the North Pole and he's trying to do two things. He's trying to find a Northern passage that will allow him to get to the North Pole. This is one of the biggest goals of enlightenment science was to see if it was possible to navigate the North Pole and to sail from one side of the globe to the other. But he's also hoping to discover the secret of magnetism. That was one of the other big goals of enlightenment science was explaining how compasses work and how these magnetic forces control it and to get to the heart of these mysteries. And so you have this man who's launching on this utopian project and his goal is to understand the world and to take these things that are mysterious and unlock them. And he believes that when that happens, it's going to create this idealistic society. He even wonders if there might be these utopian races who live up in the North Pole and he's gonna discover them. So he has big hopes and dreams for what he's going to accomplish through science. But then when he gets to the North Pole, he encounters Victor Frankenstein. 
And Victor Frankenstein, of course, is chasing the monster. He's chased him all across Europe and eventually made his way to the North Pole. And he tells his story to Robert Walton and he explains um, all of these issues uh, that have happened in his life to Walton. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting in Frankenstein is how Victor describes how he became obsessed with science. And it began in his childhood when he witnessed an electrical storm and he saw this bolt of lightning come down and destroy a tree. And he just, he, he marvels that this thing that has this incredible power to just destroy and it's just out there. And he wonders, could it be possible for us to take that and use it to actually give life instead of destroying life? And this, of course, happens right before his mother dies, which is a traumatic event for him. And so between the loss of his mother and the discovery of electricity, Victor is fueled by this desire to discover the power of animation. What is the life force that fuels humanity? Can we take control of that? And so with Victor, we get this, this embodiment of enlightenment science. Uh, between Victor and uh, Robert Walton, we have all of the enlightenment projects put there for us to look at. And they all come back to the same goal, which is to understand the mysteries of the universe and to take control. But Victor's story is a tragedy. And so he offers a lesson to Walton. And the question is whether Walton will, will learn from that lesson or not about the dangers of defying those epistemological and those moral limits that have been set up there by God or the universe. And Mary Shelley's not really clear on where those come from. All right. But one of the things that makes Frankenstein difficult to read, and the reason it's, I think, commonly misunderstood in pop culture, is because when the monster shows up and confronts Victor, and when he eventually meets Walton, he's not Boris Karloff's monster. He's not this grunting, groaning creature. He's incredibly eloquent. He's a creature who reads Paradise Lost. He has opinions, he has ideas about his condition. And so he confronts Victor and he basically tells him, I'm malicious because I'm miserable. You abandoned me. You mistreated me. And if you were good to me, I would be good. And this sounds like this incredibly um, eloquent ver uh, fictional version of Rousseau's speeches that we see in his writing. Uh, Rousseau makes this point over and over again in his confessions. He looks at his own life. He sees the sins in his own life and the, the things that he did wrong. And he blames society for them. He assumes that if he had acted if he had been treated better by society, he would have been a different kind of person. The monster articulates these ideas. The big interpretive dilemma in Frankenstein, though, is whether Mary Shelley supports them. Did she, as an author, endorse the creature's blank slate psychology? And I thought for years that she did. I've taught students that in my classes. But I've been doing a lot of research recently on Frankenstein, and that's actually, I've changed my perception of the novel. And I would say that Mary Shelley is actually a critic of the blank slate. Uh, she was certainly in influenced by Rousseau. She, she has accepted some of his ideas, but I don't think she accepts them all with at least consideration and critique. And so one of the things that changed my mind as I was going through this is comparing, you know, what scholars have typically said about uh, Mary Shelley with actually looking at her biography and things like that. So this is a quote from Paul Cantor. He's a, a, an old but influential um, uh, Mary Shelley scholar. And he says the basic interpretation of uh, Frankenstein that we should go with is that the monster is an example of Rousseau's ideas and Mary Shelley endorses those ideas that civilization corrupts us and that because of that, it produces evil. And so if you fix society, you fix people. And this is actually not consistent with how Mary Shelley writes about the problem of evil. So I have some quotes here um, that are worth thinking about. These come from an article by James O'Rourke, and he probes into Mary Shelley's writings. I did not know this until relatively recently, but Mary Shelley actually wrote a, a, for an encyclopedia. It was a history of great philosophers in Europe, and she actually did entries on Voltaire and Rousseau and some other Enlightenment philosophers. And so one of the things that O'Rourke highlights is Mary Shelley, as she, she was a, uh, a woman who had lost a child shortly before she uh, wrote Frankenstein. The child was born stillborn, and it was a very traumatic event for her. And so she thought very deeply about motherhood and the connections between parents and their children. She also had a tense relationship uh, with her father growing up because her mother died, he remarried. 
Um, and she had a tense relationship with her mother-in-law or excuse me, her, her stepmom. So she, she thought a lot about family dynamics. And one of the things that really vexed her about Rousseau is that Rousseau, who was raised as an orphan, um, had five children through his mistress that he believed he could not afford to keep. And so he turned them over to the French orphanage in Paris. And based on the horrific conditions that he experienced, it's very likely all of those children died of being overworked or starved to death. And Mush Mary Shelley, as O'Rourke points out, cannot get over this. She makes this point over and over and over again when she's talking about Rousseau. And of course, if you've read Frankenstein, you know that the monster uses the language of uh, fatherhood. And then he talks about Frankenstein as his father figure, but also as his God. And he talks about how, how um, the, uh, 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 Frankenstein has abandoned him. But what Mary Shelley highlights is that for Rousseau, Rousseau, she, she actually argues he probably felt so guilty about abandoning his children that she argues that his whole natural philosophy and his theory of the state of nature is an attempt to reject that guilt. And so she says here, nothing can be more unnatural than Rousseau's, quote, natural man. Because according to Rousseau, all emotions are socially constructed. Rousseau argues our we're, we're, in we're inclined to be kind to other people, but we're also inclined to care about our own well-being. And he argues that like a, a father's love for his child is actually socially constructed, that that's not innate. And she goes, that is not true. Common sense shows us that the, the plainest nature and conscience should show us that fathers should love their children, that men should protect women. And she argues that there are basic emotions that are supposed to be there in a human being. And those, she argues those affections are the seat of our humanity. And she argues that Rousseau is not actually showing us the way people really are. He's distorting human nature to cope with his own guilt. And she makes this point over and over again on her, on her writings. So if that's the case, it seems highly unlikely that Mary Shelley would just show us um, the, the Frankenstein monster without any kind of critique of the blank slate philosophy that he's spouting off to Victor Frankenstein. And I think when we read Frankenstein, we certainly sense that the creature has a legitimate grievance against his creator, right? Victor is a monster in many, many ways. But when the monster tells Victor that he had to murder a small child, Victor's brother, in order to get Victor's attention, and that's the only way that he can, you know, gain, uh, gain Victor's attention, we, according to Mary Shelley, know that's wrong. We know that kind of violence, that kind of, like, uh, you know, vitriolic hatred for another human being is not natural. It goes against nature. And so I think this, this when we know Mary Shelley's biography and we know her thoughts on Rousseau, it helps us realize that she's doing a lot more than just endorsing the blank slate psychology. I think she's actually critiquing it. So at the end of his article, uh, O'Rourke points out that Mary Shelley is really good at highlighting what he calls the paradoxes in Rousseau's philosophy, that Rousseau realizes we are heavily influenced by our environment. There's no way around that. But she also points out that we still want to believe that people can act contrary to their environmental influences. And when we let we ourselves be pulled down by our environment or when we blame it on our environment, we instinctively know that's wrong. We know that there's something more to human nature than just that. And so what O'Rourke calls paradoxes, I would call sin. This, you know, We're fallen people living in the fallen world. We know that impacts us. But we also know that there's something wrong with us when we use that as an excuse for our own sin. And so Mary Shelley wrestles with this. And I think she tries, she may not deconstruct it, but she definitely shows that, there, that uh, Rousseau's ideas are built on a shaky foundation. So once again, we see that horror always comes back to the, these problems of denying human nature and trying to em embrace the blank slate psychology. Mary, Estab Mary Shelley established this as, as a central theme in Frankenstein, and it's going to carry over and be there in other horror novels. I think we see this in The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. And this this is, again, one of those stories that exists in the pop culture mindset, but it's so different than what people think this novel is about is so different than what it actually is. So in the popular imagination, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is this story of a scientist named Jekyll with these noble intentions. And what he wants to do is try to find a way to remove humanity's evil impulses. And so he's experimenting with chemicals one day and he drinks some chemicals. And unfortunately he creates Hyde. He, rather than remove the monster, he unleashes the monster. And this is this idea actually comes uh, from a, a student who did a whole project on this. It was great, I learned a lot from it. This idea actually comes from the play 
play Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by John Sullivan with the actor Richard Mansfield, who's depicted here on the screen. And Richard Mansfield played Jekyll as a very sympathetic, noble scientist who unfortunately through a you know chemical accident becomes a monster. And this play was performed about two weeks before Jack the Ripper killed his first victim in Whitechapel. And so after that, there's this obsession in Victorian culture with the duality in human nature, but also this assumption that you know the, these things can be separated. And of course, this is not what Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is telling us as a story. And so in the story, uh, when Jekyll, when the actual story that Stevenson wrote, when we finally get to the revelation that Jekyll and Hyde are the same person, and we read Jekyll's diary, Jekyll makes it clear that he was born in an idyllic situation. He was born wealthy, he was born privileged, and he, he says, by nature, I was driven towards the best. I, he says, I was inclined by nature to industry, fond of the respect of the wise and the good among my fellow men, and thus, as might have been supposed, with every guarantee of an honorable future. But what Jekyll starts to realize is that he does feel this innate desire to pursue what's good, to, to win social uh, favors and you know, praise, but he also feels the desire himself to do things that society doesn't approve of. And he's very vague about what that is. And people have read this in countless ways that he's secretly gay, that he's addicted to drugs, that he's hooking up with prostitutes. It's been interpreted in all sorts of different ways. But what we have here I don't think I think it's ambiguous for a reason, and I'll come back to this point in a in a a, uh, a minute. What Stevenson wants us to think about here is that Jekyll sees this duality in himself, and so Jekyll is wrestling with this duality and wondering about what to do with it. And so his duality, wrestling with the problem of duality, recognizing that there are contradictory impulses in human nature, it actually leads him from science back to religion. And he says, this is the root of all religions. All religions realize what enlightenment science is essentially trying to deny, that human beings are a mixture of good and bad, that we have impulses to do good, but we have also impulses to do evil. And every religion in one way or another wrestles with that. And modern science in the Victorian era is attempting to deny that because it's attempting to treat people as blank slates that are a product of their environment. But Jekyll can't get over this. He says, I'm shipwrecked by the fact that man is not truly one, but two. But then this is where he, he comes to this, this thought. Perhaps science can do something about this. Perhaps science can be used to fix what religion can't fix. And so Jekyll decides that he's going to use his, his chemistry. He's going to use his, some sort of chemical concoction to fix this problem. But this is where most people have a, a, a the, again, the pop culture understanding of the novel. We assume Jekyll's driven by some sort of noble goal here, that he wants to make humanity better. That's actually not the case. Jekyll states his goals very clearly. He says, if each of these sides, I told myself, could be but housed in separate identity, life would be, oh, hang on, sorry, my screen is covering the text morning. life would be relieved of all that was unbearable the unjust might go his way delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin the just could walk steadfastly and secure on his upward path doing the good things which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of this extraneous evil so what jekyll is trying to do here is not make himself better He's actually trying to split his life in two and lead a more effective double life, a life without consequences. And it's this desire that leads him to create Hyde. And so we see this, this tension here. And so it's important to remember when Jekyll has this realization that human beings are, as he puts it, commingled of good and evil, the, uh, it's, uh, this novel is often understood as if Jekyll's a good person who unleashes an evil side. That's not it. He's a mixture of good and evil, and he ends up creating a person who is totally evil. Edward Hyde loves nothing more than causing misery to other human beings. The problem, though, for Jekyll is he's still a mixture. He's both good and evil. And so his evil side is always going to be tempted by Hyde. And so he hasn't made his life easier. He's actually made it worse. He's made his duality even more difficult. I sometimes tell my students that there, there are really not two people in the story. There's three people because Jekyll is a mixture of two and Hyde is dedicated to one. He's dedicated solely to evil. And so this is this dilemma that Stevenson comes back to, that when modern science tries to tinker with human nature, when it tries to use science to solve the problem of sin, it doesn't actually make things better. It makes things far, far worse.
And so I think once again, we're coming back to this idea that Stevenson is challenging the blank slate. He's rejecting this idea that we're born basically good and that if we have the right technology, the right chemicals, um, if we just put the right chemicals into our body, we can fix the problems of human nature. And so this is where it's very helpful, uh, I think, to look at Stevenson's own letters. He wrote a lot about his novel and responded to it. He often kind of resented the popularity that he got from this. But when he saw the popularity of Richard Mansfield's play, he was very upset because it said it changed the meaning of his story. In Mansfield's play, they make it very clear that Hyde is a sexual predator. And the reason Jekyll wants to become Hyde is so that he can engage in a sexual double life. And then that just gets out of control and Hyde becomes a very Jack the Ripper kind of serial killer. And Robert Louis Stevenson was exasperated by this. He's like, I left it ambiguous for a reason. Now, and this is a letter to his friend, John Paul Bocock. And he makes the point here that the real point of the story is not that Jekyll was a bad person because he wanted to engage in sexual immorality. Stevenson was pretty liberal about that. He didn't think that, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, violating the Judeo-Christian sexual ethic was an issue. But his point is, the issue here is not that Jekyll wanted to engage in sexual immorality. The point is Jekyll was a hypocrite who wanted to live a life dedicated to sin on one hand and on the other hand, live a life that would be respectable. And because he didn't have the courage to be, to be out and open about who he was, he created Hyde. And he makes the point that Hyde's real evil is not his sexual immorality, it's his cruelty. And that by letting out this evil in his human nature, um, that's the real evil in the story that Hyde gives into. And so Stephen's trying to make the point that all of us have this capacity for cruelty and violence. And if we're not honest and if we're not ethical, we can let that out of the bottle. And when we let it out, we can't stop it. And so again, once again, we find horror deconstructing Rousseau's ideas that we're all just blank slates, that we're all just a product of our environment. And if we get the right program, we get the right kind of people. This is a quote from G.K. Chesterton, um, and he writes about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I love this quote, so let me read it to you. He, he, he's stressing here that the Victorians loved this story, but they didn't get it. He says, alas, it is characteristic of the Victorian time that while nearly every Englishman has enjoyed the story, hardly one Englishman has gotten the point. You will find 20 allusions to Jekyll and Hyde in Day's newspaper reading. You also find that all such allusions suppose the two personalities to be equal, neither caring for the other. Or more roughly, they think the book means that man can be cloven into two creatures, good and evil. The whole stab of the story is that man cannot. Because while evil does not care for good, good must care for evil. And in other words, man cannot escape from God because good is the God in man. So again, we come back to this, this uh, Calvinistic Judeo-Christian understanding that human beings have these elements in them that are a reflection of our fallen nature. And that's the, even though Stevenson w didn't think of himself as a traditional Christian, he was born and raised in a very staunchly Calvinist family. And he rejected a lot of his family's upbringing, but he still retained this view that there's something fundamentally wrong with human nature. And if we don't acknowledge that and we don't address it, that problem does not go away. It gets worse and worse until it eventually becomes a monster. So once again, coming back to this idea of challenging the blank slate. Another Victorian novel that deals with this really well, I think, is Dracula. And I think Dracula synthesizes a lot of the ideas that we've, we've talked about so far. So when Dracula came out in 1897, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of the quintessential horror movie because all horror scenarios, the haunted house, the monster on the ship, all of these scenarios we see in monster movies are all embodied in one novel. It's just a great horror novel. But Dracula, again, is one of those novels that's commonly misinterpreted. Many people have never read the book, but they have these pop culture understandings of who they think Dracula is. And if you look at, there, there's about like 200 movies of Dracula. He's probably the most adapted movie character of all time. And typically, movie versions of Dracula almost always depict him as a sexual predator. He rarely speaks. He's just lurking in the shadows and he's waiting for some attractive woman to walk by so he can bite her. We depict him as this sexual predator or we depict him like in the Gary Oldman 1990s Dracula as this sexy, tortured, romantic anti-hero. This is unfortunately the trend that gives us movies like Twilight. Sorry, you, if you people are Twilight fans. I actually enjoy Twilight. It's kind of trashy fun, but that, that's besides the point. Um, we get this stereotype of the sexy, tortured, by ironic hero. And so there's always a tendency to take the evil of Dracula and mediate it. We want to depict Dracula as this, you know, just kind of mindless predator, like a shark, or we want to depict him as someone who's actually sympathetic. He may do bad stuff, but 
maybe something traumatic happened to him or something like that. This is the pop culture understanding of Dracula. This vampire comes, it cannot be found in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Bram Stoker gives us a very different vampire. And so one of the things that I think is so brilliant about um, Bram Stoker's Dracula is he wrote it towards the end of the Victorian era. And the Victorians were one of the first generations to harness the power of technology and try to permeate it through every aspect of society. They wanted to see what would happen when you use science to solve every problem in society. And Stoker reminds the Victorians that science alone cannot stop evil. So the, the leader of the monster hunters in Dracula is Professor Van Helsing. And he tells his friend, John Seward, who's a, a doctor, that you're really clever. You're really smart, John, but you're, you believe only in science. And if you can't explain something, you just assume there is nothing to be explained. And so for Van Helsing, the, in order to fight the vampire, you have to use science, but you also have to draw from religion. And so this is why in Dracula, you see the monster hunters using guns and they use blood transfusions to keep the victims alive, but they also rely on ancient religious devices like the crucifix or the holy water. It's this world where religion and science have to coexist in order to fight evil. And so in a society that's becoming increasingly secularized and moving away from religion, Stoker's novel, I think, is intended to remind us that these things have to go together in some way because science alone cannot fight the problem of evil. So whatever the vampire represents, whatever cultural evils it represents, for Stoker, that evil can't be stopped by science alone. You need to have a broader religious mind. I think it's very telling that Stoker, uh, was the manager of the Lyceum Theater. He worked with Henry Irving, who's the leading Shakespearean actor of his day. There are many quotes uh, from Shakespeare. And so a quote that fits very well with it, I can't I actually remember if it's actually quoted in Dracula, but if it isn't, it should be, is a quote from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. That is, I think, Stoker's ideology, that our modern ideology has grown shallow, it's grown dim. And even though we talk about enlightenment, we actually see very little because we're only looking at the world through a scientific lens. So this is one thing Stoker's novel does. It challenges the enlightenment impulse to try to take control and understand nature through science alone. Then the other thing that I think Stoker reminds us of, and this is what makes the novel so uncomfortable, is that evil is seductive, right? It, it appeals to us by, uh, highlight, by tempting us, by highlighting some sort of desire or corruption inside of. The thing that makes Dracula perhaps so terrifying is that according to vampiric lore, vampires cannot cross your threshold unless you give them permission. And so if you find yourself turned into a vampire, you were not coerced into it, you were not forced into it, you were in some way, you were in some way seduced or tempted by the vampire. And so vampires are not like werewolves or zombies who destroy and corrupt. They seduce, they tempt by identifying some sort of desire in us. So whether it's Jonathan Harker in Castle Dracula being tempted by Dracula's wives, or it's Lucy when she becomes a vampire, the, all the people in Dracula who succumb to the vampire, they're in some way complicit in their own corruption. And this is what makes Dracula so frightening. It's one thing to be threatened by this utterly horrific, repulsive creature. It's another thing to be threatened by a a creature that makes you feel like he's offering you something good. And I have a quote here, two quotes actually, that I think highlight this problem. The first is from Roger Ebert in his review of the 1931 Bela Lugosi Dracula. He says, we consider the dreadful trade-off immortality, but as a vampire. From our point of view, Dracula is committing an unspeakable crime. From his, he's offering an unspeakable gift. And I think that really highlights the dilemma in Bram Stoker's novel is that Dracula is able to convince his victims that he's offering them something worthwhile and he's able to corrupt their souls long before he corrupts their body. Kate Hamill, who's an actor um, uh, who's uh, involved with theatrical productions of Dracula, she says that in Dracula, we find a monster who takes away our agency, our choice, even as he consumes us. The fantasy of becoming a vampire is a myth of exceptionalism. Nobody fantasizes about being the random peasant whom the titular count devours. Instead, people are thrilled by the thought of turning into vampires themselves, becoming the most powerful consumer, the apex predator. And until we recognize that we have far more in common with prey than predator. We will always feel fill the uh, vampire's pull. I think that's a great insight in this novel that vampires are a reflection of our own fallen nature. They prey on us by catering to our desire to be predators. They, they cater to this desire to have power, to have control, to make the world ours. 
And then they end up destroying us and making us enslaved to them. And that's what sin from a Christian perspective does. It always offers power, but it ends up enslaving. This reminds me of the great line in Paradise Lost, where Satan is trying to tempt the angel Ab to rebel against him. And he promises him freedom. He promises him power. He promises to give him this place outside of God's hierarchy. And Abdul responds to Satan, thou art to thine own self enthralled. And this is a, that what we see in Dracula is that the Dracula, the vampire, appeals to some sort of inner desire inside us. So I want to save time for questions. So I'm going to just kind of move through these very quickly. One of the things to know is like uh, uh, Bram Stoker was a, um, pro a prodigious student of vampiric folklore. And uh, vampiric folklore starts in the 1600s, 1700s. That's where you start to have these vampire stories that sweep across Europe. And as I was doing research, I learned that Rousseau, Voltaire, all these other Enlightenment philosophers, they were very fascinated with vampires because they wanted to know if these things were just superstition or if they were new creatures that science couldn't explain yet. And of course, eventually they came to the conclusion that these were all just superstitions and myths. And they they said, you know, um, you, it's not even worth our time talking about it. In fact, Rousseau and Voltaire actually trashed this other Enlightenment philosopher who went to the trouble of writing a book trying to prove that vampires didn't exist. And they're like, you're just dignifying absurdities by writing this book. And so for them, vampires had nothing meaningful to say. And I think Stoker disagrees. He believes that vampires are cultural symbols that tell us a great deal about the growth of modernism. And so for Stoker, I think vampires are a reminder that evil does exist, that it is very real, that it has the power to tempt us by pulling the evil out inside us, and that modernism in and of itself does not have the epistemological or the moral resources to fight it. If you dedicate yourself solely to a scientific worldview, you will not have the means necessary to fight the vampire. And it's, per it's perhaps interesting that it, we're going to move from the Victorian era with the queen, death of Queen Victoria into the modern world. And we're gonna get World War I, we're gonna get World War II, we're gonna get the Holocaust. We're gonna have these great evils, which are in many ways a product of this enlightenment scientific mentality that Stoker I think is critiquing here. So I wanna end with two observations that I think are, are really interesting. So at the end of the 1931 Dracula, there's a lost epilogue. You can see the video, but the sound has been lost. And so at the end of the movie, after the vampire has been killed and order has been restored, the actor, uh, uh, Everett Van Sloan, who plays Van Helsing, comes out on the stage and addresses the audience. And he gives what seems to be a speech that's meant to console you. And he says, you know, if you go home and you're, you know, checking your house and looking around the shadows and you think you see a face in the window, you know, you think it might be a vampire, you know, and you think he's going to say, don't worry, it's all a movie. And then he turns to the camera and says, such creatures do exist. And it's a very chilling line. And I've always wondered about what's the function of this kind of scene. Because when the, the, when the camera fades to black and the movie ends, we go back into the real world and we're reminded that these creatures that terrified us in the movie don't exist. And so I've wondered what's the function of this scene trying to remind us that such creatures do exist. This reminds me of the end of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. If you've seen Psycho, um, this movie shocked audiences when it came out in 1960, and producers were not sure that audiences would know what to do with a serial killer like Norman Bates. People had never seen a movie like this before. And so there's this really tacked on scene where a psychiatrist comes out and explains away Norman's behavior and associates it with childhood trauma. And it's really tacked on. It, it really ruins the evil of the movie and undermines the, the thrills of the movie. And so Hitchcock wanted to have the last laugh. He didn't want to go out with that. And so he managed to do this and get it past the studio executives where the last shot of the movie is this scene you see right here looking at Norman Bates in his prison cell and if you look closely you can tell that Hitchcock has had the image of a skull which is generally you know a universal symbol of death evil superimposed over Norman's face and so the last thing you see is not only the creepy expression on Norman's face but this reminder of evil and so Hitchcock did not want his audience to leave the movie thinking that all the evils of the world could be neatly explained away by some psychiatrist. And again, if you if you know anything about 1950s, 1960s, that's when confidence in psychiatry and the power of, you know, ment uh, therapy was at its peak in American culture. And so Hitchcock wanted to remind people that there are things in the world that don't get neatly explained by evil. And so what all this leads to, I think, is that there's this fundamental tension in modernism, because modernism coming out of the Enlightenment wants to control the world. It wants to explain 
and take control of it. But when you do that, you lose what the philosopher Hartmut Rosa calls resonance, meaningful relationships with the world, because there's nothing bigger than you. There's nothing to be afraid of. And Rosa uses the example of a snowstorm that for children, a snowstorm is exciting, it's marvelous, but for adults, it's terrifying. And it, 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 at best, it's an interruption of your daily life. At worst, it's terrifying. And so there's this conflicted impulse in modernism to control, but when you control, you lose a loss of reverence and awe. And I think horror is a dark commentary on that impulse in the Enlightenment. And so what I think we see over and over again in great modern horror movies is this need to challenge that desire and to show that when you do that, you cut yourself off from the impulses and the feelings that human beings were meant to have. And so over and over again, we see in the Enlightenment trying to deny human nature. And over and over again, we see horror taking us back to the fact that there's something fundamentally wrong with human beings. And if that gets out of control, we become monsters. And that I think is the, the, the theme that horror returns to over and over again is this inability to control the world and that there are moral and epistemological uh, boundaries and limitations. And those are actually a good thing. I think that's what horror comes back to. So thank you for listening to my talk. And if you guys have questions or thoughts, I would love to hear them. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. That was fascinating. Covered a lot of territory and made a lot of, a lot of connections. Um, I'm sure there are some questions out there. Go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you know how to do that, or just un unmute yourself and jump right in. I know some of you will be teaching some of these books. I'll be teaching Dr. Jekyll and Hyde, so I'll be going back and looking at that letter uh, from Stevenson. That's really, really interesting. All right, questions. Don't be shy now. Dr. Jeffrey, besides the, the books and the scholars that you mentioned in your talk, are there others that you would recommend if somebody wanted to go down this rabbit hole a little bit further? Okay, so the, yes, it depends on how far down the rabbit hole you want to go. Um, a book that I particularly really love uh, because I, I know the author is Grant Horner's book, Meaning at the Movies. Uh, Grant Horner was my professor in college. And that's a, it's primarily about movies, but the applications to literature are great. Um, what the, Horner does in that book is he offers a theological reading of various movie genres. And he, he reflects how those genres um, come back to the reality of sin and how we need art because of sin. And he makes this point that all art is always kind of essentially, how should I put it, deconstructing itself because there's always an impulse in art to tell the truth, but in fallen people, there's also an urge to lie about reality. And so we find those, those things in tension with each other. So for anybody who's just, you know, maybe like interested in the layman's approach to that, I think that's a really, really good one. Um, uh, Noel Carroll's book, The Philosophy of Horror, is really good for understanding kind of the problems and tensions in horror. Like it, the paradox of horror is, is uh, Carroll's phrase for this, the fact that horror scares us, but we also like it. And typically, most of us would say we would not want to be chased through the woods by a guy with a chainsaw, but yet we'll watch that movie. And what does that say about us? And so he really wrestles with that. That's a good book. Another book that I have found interesting, I think I actually have it on my shelf. Give me one second. Um, Religion and its Monsters by um, Timothy Beale is an analysis of the relationship between religion and monstrosity. Um, one weakness, though, in the book is that it's uh, he, he is a Christian, as I understand it, but he primarily focuses entirely through a historicist lens. And that's why, like I said, I'm working on this book, because uh, for Christians, there's very little out there that offers a universal account of these things. There's just a tendency to look at books in terms of, you know, the ancient Greeks were afraid of foreigners. So that's why we get the monsters in the Odyssey. There, there's attempt to historicize everything. And so I think there's a need for that. Um, so that's that's something that I'm working towards. But those are those are some books that I've looked at recently that I found helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If you have a favorite monster, I'd love to hear it. Well, I don't want to take up all the time, but if nobody else is uh, asking a question at the moment, um, 
Uh, you mentioned uh, the Castle on Toronto early on in the in your talk, and um, I, I did some research there. Uh, can you talk at all about the grotesque versus horror? Um, have you looked into that at all? And are there differences or similarities in your estimation? Mm, that is a good question. So my my field is aesthetics, and I'm very I'm very interested in you know the the opposite of, of beauty, ugly and grotesque. Um, I think they're closely related, um, but it did. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to think out loud here, trying to give a, a, a more polished response. Um, I would say the grotesque is part of horror, but you can um, you can you can separate the two. Um, I think of Goya's paintings are kind of a classic example. Goya is someone who just seemed to be obsessed with very macabre imagery and really horrific imagery, but also to find kind of a beauty and a fascination with that. Um, a big a big figure here would probably be Edmund Burke and his his reflections on the sublime because what Burke real one of the things the romantics uh, took very seriously is that beauty beauty they they challenged the platonic idea of beauty because Plato says beauty is this universal thing and it's objective but the romantics realized a lot of the things we call beautiful are actually just culturally conditioned and so they were trying to find something that could kind of take them outside of their cultural conceptions of what's good and bad and beautiful. And for them, that's the sublime. You know, Longinus's definition of the sublime is it takes you out of yourself. And so if you encounter something that's sublime, you have this, this raw experience that it, where your, your social influences don't factor in at all. You're seeing it as it really is and you're, 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 you're having contact with the thing itself. And so Burke talks about that. And he says that what's weird is a lot of the things that give us the sublime are actually very menacing or frightening. Um, and that, you know, the, the sublime, if it's going to be greater than us, by definition, it tends to be frightening. That's getting back to C.S. Lewis's idea of the numinous. And so the grotesque is, I think there's, there's two things there. I think a lot of the things that, you know, uh, in the 1700s, 1800s, people are interested in that are grotesque are going to be associated with the sublime and the dark side of that. But I think there's also in the romantics, they're so countercultural. You know, I was describing my students, if they were around today, they'd all wear black and they'd sit in the back and smoke, you know, and hang out together. Um, they're so countercultural. They're interested in celebrating and challenging things that defy those conventional standards of beauty, just to kind of rub it in people's faces that those things are conventional. So I think there's probably two sides of that. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's that's what occurs to me at the moment. Hey, Michael asks in the chat, um, for monsters who destroy the soul, would you include witches and warlocks? Yes, I think that's a great example. Um, I'm going to teach Dr. Faustus, and you could argue that, you know, Faustus is a monster himself because he just wakes up one day and goes, you know, I'm tired of studying everything. I'm going to turn to the dark arts. I'm bored with everything. And the, you know, the, the, the root of witchcraft is this, this desire to have an illicit kind of power. Um, and it, it, it very much deals with temptation and the drama of temptation. So I think that's definitely part of, uh, I think those, those monsters would fit well in there. In a, in a larger book project, I'm going to fit in um, Hannibal Lecter, Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Hannibal Lecter is a serial killer, so he, he just certainly destroys the body. But if you read the novel, The Silence of the Lambs, it's actually very philosophical. Uh, Hannibal Lecter is constantly challenging people to try to explain to them uh, why he's evil. And there's a great scene where Clarice Starling, the FBI agent who's interviewing him, he asks her, do you think I'm evil? And she says, I think you're destructive. And he goes, is destruction the same thing as evil? Because if that's the case, then God must be evil because God loves destruction. And what he's trying to do is trying to show Clarice, if you, you can't just say someone's bad because they do something that's not socially desirable, there has to be more to it than that. And so Hannibal Lecter essentially tries to deconstruct people's understanding of good and evil. And he, the whole novel, I think, is intended to challenge the idea of behaviorism, that we're just a product of our environment. And so that, to me, is what a monster like Dracula or a witch or a warlock or a magician or, or a serial killer like Hannibal Lecter do. They challenge our moral foundation, and they make us realize that those moral categories we thought were really clear are actually not clear. A great horror movie should always unsettle you. It should make you feel like things maybe don't work the way you thought they did. 
Someone's asking about H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, and the sublime, the abolition of man. Yeah, all of these issues, Sharon, I think come back to the the, the issues C.S. Lewis talks about. That's a great book to address these issues. I am actually not familiar with H.P. Lovecraft. I know of him. I know his ideas about cosmic horror. I've never read an H.P. Lovecraft story, so I can only you know, deal with what I know about pop culture, which is probably wrong. So he's on my reading list because I feel like I need to, if I'm going to talk about monsters, I need to be more well-balanced. Okay. And uh, then Rachel said, um, folklore connections with Dracula and vampires. Are there other folklore connections with horror in general and, and, and monsters, um, sorry, horror in general and monsters in particular? So what's interesting about Bram Stoker is Bram Stoker was kind of an anthropologist. He collected a lot of um, legends and myths about vampires and he synthesized them. And so what a lot of people think about vampires entirely comes from Stoker synthesizing them. So in that, in that sense, Dracula is a very enlightenment book. It's taking all these things and trying to blend them together and make sense of them. Um, but I've been doing some, these kind of some deep dives in recently into folklore. That's not my field. I don't spend a lot of time studying folklore, but I bought, I got some books from my library. I've been going through them and I realized just how utterly bizarre and messy folklore is. Like there's a, common suspicion in in uh, vampiric folklore that people with red hair are vampires there's just all these different legends all over the place so if you have red hair everyone better watch out for you um there's just all these these just messy legends out there and so i think one of the things dracula is trying to do is trying to kind of like make sense of all of this and synthesize them together um and i, th I think maybe that's one thing horror does is it takes things that have always circulated very loosely in our culture and tries to bring them together and give them a kind of a shape and a form in within a genre. And so that, in that sense, it's very enlightenment, I, I would say. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my first thought. All right, great questions. Anybody else? Looks like a lot of you are mentioning Paradise Lost. I think those are great connections. I think Paradise Lost, I think I would argue that Dracula is, Satan is a pro, Milton Satan at least is a prototype for Dracula and any kind of seductive monster because Satan uses words to corrupt people and then turn them into monsters. And so I think, it, and of course the romantics loved Milton. They also did not understand him. Um, and one way, one way you can read Frankenstein is that it's a tension between science, which is represented by Victor, and the humanities, which is represented by the monster, because the monster learns to read from reading Paradise Lost. But neither the, I, many people don't know this actually, but Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein in a villa in Switzerland that had uh, John Milton had stayed at when he was in Switzerland. And she actually read all of Milton's works before she wrote Paradise Lost, excuse me, before she wrote Frankenstein. So she very much had Milton on the mind. Um, and I think there, there's all sorts of fascinating connections there. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, so you said your interpretation of uh, Frankenstein changed. Is is this something that will become known as the Cole Jeffrey school of thought, or are are, are there other uh, scholars out there who uh, who helped you uh, go in this direction? No, I think it's. I think you know, uh, like I said, I got that article from uh, James O'Rourke. There's also one by Lawrence Lipkin called "Mary Shelley Judges Rousseau," and so other people have made this argument. But as far as I can tell, it just doesn't seem to have made a dent in any kind of. You know, it doesn't seem to have made a dent in how people you know understand the novel or teach it. And so I think most of us were you know probably taught in high school that Victor's the bad guy. The monster is the good guy because he did some bad things or to, Victor did some bad things to him and mistreated him. And it's a very kind of simplistic, you know, um, reading of that. And I, as I, as I've grown as a student, as a teacher, I've appreciated the complexities of it, but it wasn't until I started reading more about Mary Shelley's actual thoughts on Rousseau that I realized how much she's critiquing Rousseau's notion. Yeah, uh, I, I always thought a lot of the problems in Frankenstein came from the fact that it was written by an 18 year old girl. I just imagined myself as an 18 year old trying to write a novel and, you know, the problems that undoubtedly would have been in that novel. And so I thought some of the what uh, um, O'Rourke calls the, the paradoxes in Frankenstein came from that. But I think they actually come from Mary Shelley realizing that Rousseau's philosophy is just riddled with internal contradictions and she's presenting them to her. And in, in fact, O'Rourke actually quotes Mary Shelley. And she said, 
my her father, William Godwin, who was a famous philosopher, and her husband Percy, she said they're believers, meaning they 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 have a cause and they believe in their cause. She said, I'm an observer. I I see what things happen, what people do, and I try to offer that to people in my writing. I don't try to take a side. And when I understood that, I thought, oh, that makes so much more sense of Frankenstein. Because there's literally passages in Frankenstein where Victor tells Robert Walton, be ambitious, challenge the limits, go ahead and push the world, don't care about the consequences, you know, do what, you know, pursue knowledge. And then like two pages later, he grabs him and shakes him and says, don't do what I did, don't be ambitious, it will ruin your life. And I, if I had been Mary Shelley's editor, I would say, you got to take that out because th those don't make any sense. But I think that's what Mary Shelley is trying to show is that human beings are that contradictory, we're that paradoxical. Okay. What about no. what about Northanger Abbey and its commentary on the Gothic movement? It's been a long time since I've read Northanger Abbey, but as I remember it, it's it's uh, uh, Jane Austen very much having fun with the vogue for the Gothic and taking. There were so many Gothic novels that they were getting uh, people were taking them way too seriously, and so Jane Austen wanted to poke fun at that, and that's that's what I remember about that. But I need to I need to revisit that and get a better understanding about this. All right. Well, hopefully um, we can all start to help our students understand uh, Frankenstein a little bit better. So um, you can say you heard it here first. But yeah, we um, hope your book gets published eventually. Of course, you have to write it first, but yeah, slight detail. Uh, but yeah, good stuff. Uh, some more right. about Grendel, I guess. Um, that would be a monster that destroys uh, the body, right? Yes, I think Grendel, ancient monsters, uh, uh, Carrier, to me, they they're tend to be pretty simple because they're, they're generally almost always just threats to the body. And ancient people lived in a world where there were so many constant threats to your just basic survival. And so Grendel is in one sense a pretty basic monster because all he does is just kill people. But as I'm, uh, I'm preparing to teach Beowulf again this, uh, this year, and as I'm going through it, one of the things that strikes me is that Grendel is also anti-joy. He hates hearing people sing. He hates hearing people worship. And so his desire is not just to kill people, it's to it's to, to challenge the bonds that bring people together. He attacks them, he attacks the the uh, the Danes whenever they gather together in their mead hall. And in Viking culture, that was the center of their world. It's what brought people together. It's where they made their laws, it's where they had their weddings and their funerals. It, it's really the cultural hub that keeps everything together. And so I think Grendel kind of, you know, represents this anti-civilization force. And so throughout, you know, ancient cultures and medieval cultures, there's always these destructive forces that try to destroy the bonds that bring people together and that hold society together. I think that's what Grendel, um, you know, that's what Grendel's role is. Yeah. All right. We're about out of time. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Jeffrey, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this for us. Thanks to everybody I am, who showed up. I am happy to do it. And I think I can share my presentation in the chat. If you give me one second here, let's see how that will work. I think if anybody would like to look over it, I tend to be a fast talker, as my students tell me. So if anything was unclear or you want to go back and look at it, let's see here. Uh, everyone, let's see if this will share with everybody. Very good. Okay, sending that PowerPoint. Hopefully you all get it. If not, feel free to email me and I'm happy to forward it to you. All right. Well, hopefully we can do this again next summer. So stay tuned, everybody, for um, who we have next summer. But enjoy your school year and um, all God's blessings on all your labors. And thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great start to your fall. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you, Dr. Soderberg.